What is up, guys? So, uh, Walmart has gotten a little too into the holiday spirit. They must have uh, realized everybody trying to do the holiday shopping that they had to come out with something and then apologize for it. So, Walmart nailed the holiday spirit this year. Um, check this out. Now, I know it's not just me, and if you can't see this, it's Frosty the Snowman sitting behind a table with three lines of blow, or I mean snow, sitting right in front of them that are like perfectly chopped up fine lines. Now, I know it isn't just me because there is a whole article on this, but uh, I guess holiday shopping has just gotten to some people and uh, if you get a little bit down and you need a little bit of a pick-me-up, there's always that. So, way to go, Walmart. Proud of you for that one. Um, in other news, remember we talked about the Peloton bike and how it was fat shaming everyone? Well, Joe Biden took the cake in this one. Check this out. A long time, and I know more than most people know. And I can get things done. That's why I'm running. And you want to check my shape on? Let's do push-ups together, man. Let's do. Let's run. Let's do whatever you want to do. Let's No one has said my son has done anything wrong, and I did not on any occasion. And no one has ever said it. Not I didn't once. say you were doing anything wrong. I you said, said I set up my son to work in an oil company. Isn't that what you said? I, Get your word straight, Jack. That's what I we hear on the on MSNBC. All you don't hear that in MSNBC. No, no, you did not hear that. No, but you no, heard. No, Look, no, okay, I'm not going to get an argument with you, man. No, no, I don't want to. Well, yeah, you do, but, uh, but look, fat, but look, fat. You surprised? I am. It, look, it, looks, it looks like you, you don't have any more back over than Trump does. Oh. Oh. Let him talk. Let him talk. Any other questions? Yeah, all right. I'm not voting for you. Well, I knew you weren't, man. You think I thought you'd stand up and vote for me? You're too old to vote for me. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. That is good. Now, uh, let's jump into this. I'm your host, The Shoe, and this is The Shoeman Show. Now, in all seriousness, and relating to all this fat shaming and this kind of garbage that's been going around, the body positivity movement and all that, um, I guess we're going to have to talk about it. Which is fine, because it gives me something to talk about, and you have nothing better to do anyway. So here we go. Um, I know I touched on it a little bit last week in regards to the bike, but I wanted to dive more into the issue of body positivity and obesity within our world today. Main reason for this is because society is pushing the narrative that it is okay to be vastly overweight, and I believe that this is leading to the recent decline in our life expectancy here in America, which was previously at a 78.7, and now it's at a 78.6. According to CNBC last year, which in reality, it doesn't seem like a drastic change, but it's the fact that it's in the opposite direction. Now, this is why I kind of found as the underlying cause of all of this. Up until the recent decrease, we were on a steady rise toward longer life expectancies. The life expectancy is made up on an average, right? So in order to lower an average means that people must be dying at younger ages. Everything seemed to be going so well because we relied on actual scientific research to improve life as well as prolong it. But now that truth has been pushed aside as something relative and in the eye of the beholder, is now uh, we are now offering opinions and feelings over actual facts and statistical truth. This leads to a bias of data being generated and doctors are being forced to work within this bias. Now, doctors within their professions, well, not everywhere, but in some places are being told that they can't fat shame their patients or tell them that they're incredibly overweight or that they need to work on themselves or their body figure because they are fear of fat shaming them. So instead, they are told to withhold that data and the person eventually dies because of an unhealthy lifestyle. Seems like a good trade-off, huh? So because you were afraid to get your feelings hurt, you die. Way to go, America. Doctors use data every day in their profession. You know, things like actual science to help diagnose an issue. And yet they have been slow to accept data on weight bias. Now, um, 
this this is coming from NBC News, okay? Let me read this again. Now, NBC News states that doctors use data every day in their profession, and yet they have been slow to accept the data on weight bias and wellness. A 2018 Drexel University study on healthcare avoidance showed that one's body mass index, or BMI, was correlated with weight stigma, increasing body shame, and rising healthcare stress. And a 2012 survey of almost 2,500 U.S. women found that 69% endured recurring fat bias. Now, uh, let's when we go through this, you know, doctors use data every day in their profession. You know, like things like actual science or statistics or you know, scientific experiments as to diagnose what may be going wrong within a person's body. Crazy. I know. And they didn't, you know, they have yet been slow to accept data on weight bias and wellness. Well, duh. I mean, they would much rather give you the hard truth and save your life than have to put you in a body bag a few years from now. That, that's why you go to a doctor is to get better. That's, that's why you go. You don't go to have people tell you how great you're doing. You're going to them because something is wrong and you need to figure it out. Sometimes you're not going to like what people have to say. Accept it. Grow up. Move on. Or do something about it. I know. It's hard. It's really hard, you know. But the last part of this part of the article is the part I want to focus on quick. The idea of fat shaming. This war. Oh no, you feel shame for the way you took care of your body. That's a good thing. Now, you should feel shame. If you're completely out of weight, you should feel shame. You are destroying the only body you are you have been given within this lifetime. And if you aren't taking care of it, you should be shamed about it. <sighs> now, and not everybody's like, well, shame is such a bad thing. No, not necessarily. You know, sometimes you can take that shame, you can turn it around into something positive and become something that you aren't so ashamed of. <gasps> Whoa, I know. Now, look, I am completely covered in tattoos, okay? Now, many people all the time, and not, I'm not even done getting them, I'm getting more, it is what it is, now, I hear other Christians say, Oh, your body is a temple. How dare you do that? Don't you have any respect for your body? Blah, 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 meaningless words. Now, look, I'm sorry if my tattoos hurt you, but I guarantee you that the ink on my body won't kill you as fast as the Happy Meal you're getting from McDonald's. So, your body is a temple. You were created by God for, from the moment of conception. Now, why in the world would you take that incredible gift of your body and completely ruin it because you fail to heed any self-control over your food intake? So, before you start raging on people because they got tattoos and stuff like that, maybe you should check yourself in your own body because last time I checked, a lot more people were being killed by Happy Meals than what were being killed in the tattoo parlor. Now, the article continues. Public health researchers have repeatedly demonstrated that Americans perceive obesity negatively, negatively because they attribute extra weight with personal failure. I'm just going to let that go. Anyhow, these anarchist views, or anachronistic views, persist despite extensive scientific work that has shown that there are clear genetic and environmental factors that often contribute to obesity. End quote. They attribute extra weight to personal failure. Ready? Because it is. It is. How dare you? I know. Oh, I'm a horrible person. Well, you should know that by now. This is only my seventh episode, so if you haven't figured it out, here we go. You are failing your body. Thus, why you feel failure when you're being fat shamed. And potentially, this is causing you to have health issues that could have been avoided if you weren't failing your body. Those, if those precautions were taken, you would potentially be a healthy person or more healthy than what you were. Now, I'm not saying give up bacon. Don't be crazy. We don't have to jump to the extreme of either side of this topic, okay? Now, bacon or really any other food, but definitely not bacon, okay? Enjoy them in moderation. Have some self-control 
and limit yourself to your own intake. Challenge yourself to get up off the couch or from behind that keyboard that you love to yell and scream at me from. Do something active, do something fun or not fun. I don't care, just get out there and do something. I personally don't care if you're having fun doing it or not. But don't come back to me and tell me that your feelings are hurt because now all of a sudden your arteries are clogged with gunk from stuff that you were eating and you were unable to take care of yourself. Now, look, my wife, I love her to death, but sleep is extremely sacred to my wife. I, I cannot emphasize this enough. I can't put enough stress on how important this is. But when the woman is asleep, I do not wake her at all unless... I decided to have a death wish that day. Now, which, I mean, I don't because I care for you guys and I know you guys would miss me and don't worry. I, I need to be there for you guys. So don't worry. Now, yet my wife, she sets several alarms, not, not just one. I mean, she sets several alarms to wake herself up before she has to go to work so that she can go to the gym and work out. I can't even begin to tell you the amount of alarm clocks that I have gone through or the amount of times I've had to patch up drywall in the bedroom because of said alarm clocks flying through space. Um, but, do, you know, this is all uh, due to the alarm, of course, waking her from her sacred sleep. Now, she knows that if she doesn't remain healthy, she will get sick. And on top of that, she wants to look good. Why is that a bad thing? She wants to fit in her little red dress and she wants to go out, have a good time. She wants to go hike for miles in the wilderness, do Spartan races, go whitewater rafting, do whatever she wants. She wants to have a healthy and fit body, which makes her feel more attractive. Why is that a bad thing? She is giving up sleep, which she wouldn't give up for me, I promise, to be a healthier, better person because she wants to live a longer life. She wants to be active. She doesn't want to miss out on things because she didn't take care of herself. Now, when I was dating, I only dated women who were for the most part in shape because the mentality to stay in shape is rough. It is super hard. And to force yourself to do something you hate for the greater good is a strong, positive thing to have. Not only that, but I was under the impression that if a woman could take care of her own body and take care of herself, then in turn, she would be able to take care of the health of her family and be able to raise people up because raising a family is also hard work and not something that somebody wants to do every day. Basic underlying fact is that if somebody was able to take care of themselves, they would be able to take care of others. But if you let yourself go, it shows me that you're lazy and you don't care about yourself. And if you don't care about yourself, how could you possibly care about another person? I know it seems harsh. Oh, geez. Yeah, yell at me and write me hate mail. Good. Go for it. Finally, the article ends with this. As with sexuality and gender identity, age, or racial biases... The path forward to com combat weight bias in the medical community will be arduous and slow, but that does not mean we should abandon the cause. With plenty of research demonstrating the negative impact physicians have weight loss biases on patients, American physicians can and must do better. This gets down to the foundation of the, um, of the issue that he brings up in this article. It isn't really the weight itself, it's the affir affirmation of an unhealthy lifestyle and the choices that bring along with it. We are told now in America that you should love who you are because you are the best you. Well, sorry to be blunt, but you are not the best you. I am not the best me. <clears throat> and to think as such puts limitations upon ourselves as to better ourselves and make ourselves better. Now, the moment that you think you're the best person that you can be is the moment you have placed these restrictions upon yourself. <clears throat> there is no room for improvement because you already think you're the best and everything on TV and everything like that is telling you you're the best. It's a blatant lie. This body positivity movement has ruined a lot of self-responsibility about your own personal behavior and the actions that you take every day to live out. Um, and this whole neglation that shame is bad. Shame is a good thing. Like I said before, it's a recognition of improvement you can make within your own life. It can 
<clears throat> force you to be a better person. Sometimes the things that are the hardest to hear are the things that we need to change. It's a tough pill to swallow at times. Like I know I do just some dumb stuff, but I need to be told that, hey, what you're doing is dumb and uh, you should probably not do that anymore. Well, I might not like hearing it at the time, but it's in that moment that I need to either make that change if it's being detrimental to my health and to my life or continue doing it because I'm too lazy to do something about it. The same goes for this. The self-love movement has made us a society extremely selfish toward one another and only looking out for ourselves to attempt to, to justify unhealthy behavior, lack of responsibility, and even leading us to kill those who have been viewed as an inconvenience. Suicide is another contributing factor with it in this decline of life expectancy. And as sad as it is, it shouldn't really come as a surprise. Um, when we devalue what it means to be a successful human being and we fail to try to make ourselves better, we lose a sense of self-worth within ourselves. Um, this, this is because we are no longer doing anything to set ourselves apart from other people. And though the commercials on TV may say that you're fine the way you are, or people around you know deep down inside that you aren't. Okay, again, <laughs> I know this isn't a fun episode. Oh no, but it's true. The more you're, you're being surrounded by people that are telling you that all this stuff is okay, or you're hearing on the TV that this attitude is okay and everything like that. Well, pretty soon if everything's okay, then you're not gonna work for anything. And if you end up not working toward anything, you're not gonna have that sense of self-fulfillment and you'll end up um, losing that sense of self-worth and that you're worthless and you don't mean anything. This uh, leaves a gap within your within yourself that can't be filled if you are too lazy to find something to fill it with. As for myself, Jesus Christ, and that is what fills my void. With that, I have family and I need to make sure that they get an incredible life as well as myself and my job to be able to give it all at my job so that I can become successful through that hard work. It's that fulfillment of doing something within the society to further advance not only my family, but society itself, as well as my relationship to my creator. All of these are extremely important things where if we were to just sit on the couch and do nothing, we would have nothing to show for ourselves and our lives would become meaningless, which would then reflect how we feel about ourselves as being meaningless and um, without purpose which can be extremely dangerous, especially in young people today. And these young people are being told that they can, you know, stay at home, you don't have to do anything like that. You know, just just get a degree in dance theory and see what happens. And then these people get these degrees and they're unable to go out and make something of themselves. And it, it drives their confidence down because they're unable to find something that they went to study for, to work in as an actual field. And, uh, Failure to find purpose in that and failure to find a job or you to even support yourself has extreme mental ramifications upon how you perceive yourself within the world. Now, the suicide rates are obviously higher because um, the younger generations are living with their parents in their mid-20s or longer. You will never become anything if you continue to live with your parents because you have a safety net. You have nothing you need to work for because mommy and daddy will take care of everything. That's why when some of these kids are being kicked out, um, they rely on the government. That's why we're seeing a push for such a socialist Marxist um, agenda in hand because people don't want to take responsibility for their lives anymore. They don't want to have the responsibility of going out there and working and being able to build up a life for themselves because they're, it's so much easier to rely on the government to give them that life. Well, the government is not in that place. That is not what the government was intended to do. The government was in place to establish rights within um, or to ensure that we all receive the rights that were imbued upon us from the Constitution of the United States and the Declaration of Independence. When the infringement upon these rights comes upon one of us, that is when the government is to step in. The government is not there to be your babysitter. The government is there to assure you that you have everything necessary for yourself to go out into the world and to make yourself into something that could be potentially great if you are willing to put in the work for it. And this all goes back to the healthcare debate too. When we, you know, put in the 
the two together. Now, because somebody isn't taking care of themselves and they're living on the McDonald's diet and clogging up their arteries, now they expect me, who takes care of myself and be and is careful about what I put in my body, now all of a sudden I'm responsible to pay for his medical bill. In what world is that okay? So because he neglects himself and neglects what he is um, putting in his body, neglects to have restraint, neglects to take care of himself, because of his actions, us healthy people are now responsible to take care of him. That makes absolutely no sense and all that money comes out of our pocket. If you want to give live a good life, don't depend on other people to do it for you. You need to do that for you. You need to take control of your own life, have some personal responsibility, and take charge. That is why the single healthcare system will only lead to not only um, worse medical care, but also to people taking less and less care of themselves because eh, it doesn't matter what I go into the doctor for. It doesn't cost me anything, so why not? That and the doctor field will end up getting just destroyed because people who become doctors get paid exorbitant amounts of money. Well, now if healthcare becomes free, their pay goes down. The government is not going to pay your medical physician the same amount as what we pay our medical physician because the government does not have money for it. And the reason why doctors make such good money is because they went to school for like eight years to go do something like that. Now to Rob, when what you're doing by saying that you deserve healthcare is a right. Healthcare is not a right. By you claiming that you want it to be a right is essentially stealing their education that they paid for away from them. You are telling them, hey, the time you spent in college means absolutely nothing because I believe that I deserve what you went to school for for free. That you don't, that it's a right. So you have to supply that for me right now. That's all that the government healthcare, that universal healthcare garbage is. So people will stop going to be a doctor and we will find an extreme lack of doctors within this country and the medical ambition that leads us to find new cures for things will drop off dramatically. See that over in Canada, the wait times are exorbitantly long to, in order to get health at, or a checkup at a healthcare clinic and the service sucks. We have people coming all the way down kind of why we're, I'm from, from Canada because their health care system sucks up north so they have to come down here in order to get treated because guess what? We're better than them. Not afraid to say it. We just are. Now... Not only this, but uh, the suicide rates have become higher because the younger generation are still with their parents, as we previously discussed, kind of to um, <laughs> wrap this whole thing together here. This reliance on outside forces other than yourself for a decent way of life will not only leave you with a disappointing life, but will leave you with nothing to show of all your accomplishments because you obviously had none. And you know what? You shouldn't have anything. If you can't get out there and you can't make yourself a productive unit to society, you shouldn't have anything. Now, I know that seems so harsh. Oh. Well, that's because it is. I do not live to support you. That is not my job. My job is to support my family and those that I care about and to support my church. When people do fall upon hard times, then the church can help to take care of that. It isn't within their own communities. It's not robbing churches with taxes, you dumb dolts. Now, if people would take a little bit more responsibility, then we could all just take care of ourselves. And then, guess what? We wouldn't have to worry about other people. Everybody could just do whatever they wanted because they were responsible for themselves. But everybody wants a lack of responsibility. This comes absolutely true when we talk about this issue of abortion. Now, maybe you follow me on Twitter, maybe you don't. I said something that ended up making a few people mad, just, just a little mad. Now, there was this law that was put in place that is continuing to be put into place that states that, um, that uh, a woman must have a um, ultrasound before she goes through with an abortion and it was upheld in the courts. Well, um, it was posted on some liberal actress's uh, website. 
or on our Twitter page, and I commented, oh no, you might actually have to see the person you're going to kill. Well, people blew up, and they didn't like that a whole lot, and uh, there was a lot of tears that were flowing out of that post. Well, the thing is, abortion is something that should be talked about repeatedly because it is the biggest stain on our on our um, country today. Now, this is uh, the absolute fact that the left wants, and it also ties into this because it proves that the left absolutely wants no responsibility over their lives whatsoever, no matter the consequences, even if it in me means killing a child rather than to have to stop sleeping around or partying. This is the party that claims that they should have the responsibility to make a choice. They believe that they have the choice to kill another human being or not kill a human being, that the choice is up to them when they couldn't even make a decent choice the night that they defy, decided to have unprotected sex. Now, I hear many, many people claim that it isn't a life, that a fetus isn't a life. Well, let's look at the definition of life. Life, by definition, is the condition that distinguishes animals and plants from inorganic matter, including the capacity for growth, reproduction, functional activity, and the continual change preceding death. Let's break this down so that everyone can understand it real simple-like, okay? The distinguishing mark of a fetus from a rock. Yeah, we're breaking this down. Rock, fetus, okay? One's a stone, one's a living being, okay? Now, the biggest distinguishing part is that a fetus begins to grow and cells themselves begin to divide in a systematic way in such a way that according to this process, if left within this process, will become a human being. A fetus moves around. It feeds via the mother. Rocks do not feed. They do not move around unless they are moved by an external force. We touched on the reproduction of cells that leads to a fetus becoming a child, a toddler, and then later an adult. All stages of human development. Human development, okay? Some people state that a fetus is not a person, which is completely outrageous considering the fact that a fetus is indeed a human stage of development, much like baby, child, toddler, teen, or adult. These are all human, but simply specify the age or the progression stage of that human being or that we are speaking of. Ask any pregnant woman if her fetus is completely unproductive. Ask her if it moves around. Ask her if it just stays still forever. Ask her if it does nothing at all. I'm sure she would completely disagree with you, thus again constituting life. Rocks don't move around on their own. Babies do. This, everything is so stupid. And they claim to be the party of science. I'm an idiot and I know this. Now, finally, at the time of conception, this is when the child's life begins. And it also begins its journey to death. Remember in the definition? The continual change preceding death. This is the, the continual change fetus, baby, child, toddler, adult, blah, 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 right? To death. Now, a morbid concept. Yeah, it's true. We all started dying the time that we were conceived. The timer was set and our life began at the time of conception. Death became inevitable. That human being began his or her journey toward adulthood and later death at that very moment. Now, uh, people argue, whoa, what about sperm? You know, sperm is a, is a life. Why aren't you calling out for laws against masturbation and laws against that? That's because sperm is not <clears throat> sperm is not a viable human being. Until it fertilizes the egg and the, the egg becomes an embryo. And then the embryo of fetus is at conception is when it becomes a potential human being. Sperm alone by itself will never become a human being. Crazy, I know, it's weird, but these people are so uneducated that they need to be told that as well. Another argument that I've heard is that the fetus isn't sentient and that sentience is an absolute necessary requirement for constituting life. Sentience means the feelings or sensations as distinguished from perception 
and thought. Okay, so basically it mainly means being aware of your surroundings and being able to process and adapt them as needed. Now, if this were the case and you fall asleep, you are no longer sentient. Therefore, you are legally able to be killed during your slumber without any consequences. I mean, if we're just sticking to what you said is true, right? I mean, if we would take this logic all the way, somebody put on, and that was the other thing too. Somebody was like, well, it's not a life because the mother's body is essentially life support. So are you gonna go around to all the hospitals and just start pulling plugs because, oh, it's just life support. They aren't a human being anymore. And it's called life support. What is it supporting? Life. Life is there. So if you say that being in a mother in the womb is life support for a child, it is life support. It is supporting life. The life being the child within the womb. How is this so difficult for you to understand? You don't even know what you're saying because you're saying things that... You're saying life support. Supports life. Realize what you're saying. Don't, don't be dumb. Come on. Now... This, uh, because, anyhow, getting back to it, when you're asleep, you're unaware of what's really going around you. Therefore, you're not being sentient. Or if you're unconscious, why don't we just off you? You're not a human being anymore. If you want to take the, these examples to the absolute extreme, we'll do it. It's just not going to make a lot of sense. And, but apparently they only want to apply these arguments to children or babies because... They're an inconvenience and they want to kill off as many of them as they possibly can because they're hurting the earth and the environment. So you're doing the world a public service whenever you kill a baby. It is absolutely disgusting and gross. And by the way, I saw that Greta made uh, Time Magazine, which makes complete sense in regards to what we're all talking about because uh, she cares more about the earth than what she does about stuff like this. So uh, by killing off your children, you know, Sending them to abortion clinics and having them killed. You know who else was in the Time magazine in 1938? Adolf Hitler. So Time magazine tends to love its socialist fascists or people who love supporting killing uh, other people. So way to go, New York Times. And way to go, Greta. Now, and, and we think that the left has changed. Or some people claim or, the left is different than what it used to be. Well... Not really. In fact, they're acting the exact same toward abortion as what the Democratic Party of the South in regard, acted in regards to slavery. They don't want to recognize babies as human beings so that they can kill them and keep a free and clear conscience at the same time, which is exactly what the Democrats did to dehumanize blacks in the South. They didn't want to recognize them as human beings because then they wouldn't have, to, then they wouldn't have their labor force. And... We all know Democrats are extremely lazy and they would never get anything done. Now, and the more that they dehumanize the African Americans, then the easier it was to make them work for them. The easier it was to whip them. The easier it was to make them do all those things. Once you dehumanize something so much to the point where you don't even recognize it as human, you can treat it however you like. And the Democrats have realized this since their beginning. And it hasn't changed since. They're doing the same thing with children in the womb as what they were doing with uh, slaves um, back in the early years. And we also saw it with Margaret Sanger establishing um, abortion clinics within black neighborhoods to try to expunge or eliminate African Americans within America itself. You want to know the party of that's racist? Do a little research on the history of the Democrats. It will blow your mind. Now, we're that uh, they don't recognize them as human beings because, like I said, they can't. It would be too much for them to handle. Now, the Republican Party has stood for the rights of individuals since then, and we will still stand for them today, whether that is the color of your skin or the inability to cry out for freedom within the womb. We will be there to give a voice for those who have none. And that is what the party should remain to be. We shouldn't cave in. We shouldn't, um, you know, give an inch because they'll take a mile. They do it every time. This is something that needs to be stood on firmly and it needs to be ended. And I re totally respect everyone that is out there fighting that fight. Check out the church at Planned Parenthood. Um, I'm going to try to have him on closer to 
the time when uh, the March for Life is going on this year. So check that out, guys. Uh, now, if you recall way back in time in one of my super early ones, um, I believe it was the Grasping for Straws episode. We talked about Matthew 7, and I said I was going to finish it. Well, it's been a while, but I'm going to finish it, okay? So here we go. Let's talk about, jump into Matthew, chapter Matthew, ah, Matthew chapter 7, all right? Starting at verse 15, um, because if you want to recap, you're going to have to go back and listen to that stuff, because I'm not going to repeat myself again, because I don't have the time. And uh, this whole episode has so far been about personal responsibility, so take some responsibility and go listen to it yourself. Now, moving on. Verse 15 of chapter 7 goes on and it says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. <clears throat> you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes or thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. So let's break this down, all right? Because this is going back to a really old question from a gentleman who tends to watch my show. So I'm going to finish it. Now, I think... Uh, so in verse 15, we are told to beware of false teachers or prophets. This would be anyone who teaches another gospel other than what we have previously discussed. That is, that you are saved by Christ alone and faith alone through his grace alone, okay? And your works mean absolutely nothing in regards to the eternal salvation itself. There is no need to produce fruit. You are totally and completely saved eternally in regards to eternal salvation. We'll get into the works later, but it is completely separate from eternal salvation. Now, a works-based salvation cannot bring forth good fruit because without the foundation of actually being saved in Christ alone through grace alone that fruit is completely worthless thus the good things you do go without meaning within the eternal kingdom therefore you must have your faith in Christ alone and through grace alone that you may be able to produce good fruit does that make sense so if you believe that you're saved by your works your works are doing nothing for you they are not getting you to eternal salvation they are doing legitimately nothing for you but if you are saved, now these works that come from you begin to bring glory to God, which is what we were intended to do within this church age. Now, the same goes for scripture and why it is so important. We see that um, a good foundational understanding of scripture will only produce good fruit. But a poor understanding of scripture will only produce poor fruit. Right? So somebody who tells you you have to do such and such and such and such in order to be saved is producing bad fruit because now he is completely leading you away from the gospel and what it means to be eternally saved. Now, if somebody says, you know, believe in Christ and you're saved, then that produces good fruit because then people begin to, they believe that. And then when as they begin to grow their relationship with Christ, that is when they become to become a better person or they want to grow to create a better life with Christ. Not all Christians will do this, but many will. Now, um, we see this every day in life as we go to the workplace and even through our politics. The good policies or the good ideas produce positive results. or The poor policies produce bad results. Same thing. Bad interpretation of scripture is going to give you very bad results from the people that believe that bad interpretation of scripture. But a good interpretation of scripture will produce good fruits or good works or a good understanding of what it means. A bad interpretation of scripture will not lead you to do a, a scripturally accurate or good thing. And a good interpretation of scripture will not lead you to do bad things. So that is what that is all about. Um, the same goes for scripture and why is it important to take scripture in context so that we get the correct understanding and for what it literally says and not trying to read our own interpretation into the scriptures. Now, because only good teaching can come from a good understanding of scriptures, okay? Now, that is what he's talking about with the fruit. Now, wrapping this up, we, we need to look at the fruit of the teacher. Does this fruit check out with the scripture? Is 
Is it within context? Does it support faith alone and Christ alone? As the earlier part of this chapter that we discussed, absolutely does. Remember that we're told not to judge, that judge not or yet, you know, yet you be judged. That whole thing was about us judging each other and our eternal salvation, that we are not to do that. That is God's place. That is not our thing to do. This just wraps that up and says, you know, um, does what this teacher is saying stand on that biblical foundation? Now, then it ends with these words, cast down into fire. And everybody all of a sudden assumes that they want this to be mean hell again, because everybody has a knee-jerk reaction that whenever fire is involved and it's in the Bible, everybody's like, hell, it means hell. Everything means hell. This whole Bible's a book of hell. That is not the case at all, so stop doing it because it's wrong and it is completely destroying your exegesis when it comes to biblical understanding. Now, verse 19 reads, Every tree that brings forth, that bringeth not good fruit, is hewn down and cast into fire. Stop it. These works will be burned in the judgment seat for us believers. Remember, he is speaking to believers. We discussed that in the beginning of this chapter. The target audience is believers. So why would he be talking about unbelievers in a verse regarding believers? Okay? His audience is believers. He is talking about the works that they do that do not bring glory to God or that don't do anything. They will be cast down and they will be burned during this judgment time. Okay? Now... He uses fire to separate what we do as good and what we do as bad through our lives because fire is a purification process. This has absolutely nothing to do with eternal salvation or he would say would be cast out into hell. If God wanted to say hell, he would say hell. I mean, it's... Why would he want to be confusing about what he's saying? It's by this fire that we will know the good from the bad and at the time of judgment of our works because... Remember, his audience is Christians. It has nothing to do with eternal salvation, but rather the works you accomplished here on this earth. Now, this leads perfectly into the kingdom, and this is where your works come in, okay? Everybody ready for this? Now, the fruit will also determine who an overcomer is, or who is an overcomer, and who isn't an overcomer. All overcomers are Christians, but not all Christians are overcomers. Now, what does that mean? Now, a person comes to faith and they end up, you know, trusting in Christ, grace alone, through faith alone. But they end up doing nothing with that. They just live on their life as they continue, you know, as they lived it on. Those people would not be overcomers. They would still be Christians because they would still be saved. It's a one-time thing of putting your faith in Christ that saves you, okay? But they would not reap the rewards or the benefits of this. Uh, they would not become an overcomer. An overcomer would be somebody who accepted that faith and then lived out their life in obedience to Christ. They would become an overcomer. Now, some Christians will have believed Christ as their Savior for an instant, but have no change. These Christians will go to heaven, but they will be unable to enter the kingdom. The kingdom is a place that resides within heaven. Think of it as a city or within a state or for, you know, simplistic purposes. Not everyone will gain entrance to the city, though everyone will reside in heaven. Everyone, by everyone, I mean every Christian. Obviously, unbelievers will go to hell. That's how the cookie crumbles, okay? These people are calling me a hell denier. Hell is very real. It's not for Christians. Newsflash, hell is not for Christians. I know that's a hard concept for you to understand. Now, not everyone will gain entrance to the city, though they will all reside in heaven. Notice. In verse 21, he states, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Not everyone will gain access to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom resides in heaven. He is not talking about heaven in general. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22 is talking about those believers who were saved by their works. Saved by their works. I put it in air quotes, guys. Okay, just in case you're listening. <clears throat> These works, and by saved by their works, and that they were necessary for eternal salvation. These are the people who believe that, okay, now that I accept Christ as my Savior, I have to do good things. I have to, you know, I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this, I can't do this, and I can't do that. And they base their perseverance of their salvation, because they believe that they can lose it if they don't do all those things, on their works. 
Now they will tell you, oh, it's not necessary to do works or it's not a workspace salvation, but you need to produce good fruit in order to prove you were a Christian. Then it's a workspace relationship. That's what it is. If you need to produce fruit, then it's a work-based relationship. The end of the story. There's no way around it. You you run circles all day, but you say the same thing over and over again. Well, you works aren't necessary, but you need to have them to prove you were saved. So what? Then they're necessary. Stop. Stop. Be clear with your words. Now, they they didn't do these things for the glory of God, but rather they did these works for themselves. They did it because they were so worried about not making it into heaven that they felt the consistent need to have to do these things. And this diminishes the not only the grace of God that saves them, but it diminishes what Christ did on the cross. And I lose the grace, the gift of grace, as did nothing to further. Uh, let me start over on that. Okay, they diminished the work that Christ did on the cross and diluted the grift of grace. And these works did nothing to further the gospel of Christ because they were so focused upon themselves. Now in verse 23, he will profess to them that he never knew them. This doesn't mean he sends them to hell. Stop it. I don't know where you're getting that from, but it's horrible exegesis. He doesn't allow them within the kingdom. These are Christians who grasp to their works for salvation and made that the priority of their relationship to Christ. Okay? These are people who came to know Christ, but then they felt like they needed to perform works throughout their entire life in order to stay within God's good graces. And that is not the case. Because then, again, like we stated, they're working for themselves. They're not doing anything to bring glory to God. They're simply working for themselves to make sure that they get into heaven. It completely misses the point of what these works are supposed to do. He does, does, now, he doesn't send them to hell. He just doesn't allow them within the kingdom. These are Christians who grasp the works for perseverance of their salvation and made that the priority of their relationship to Christ. While they were so focused on themselves and the works they felt they needed to do, they failed to grow a relationship with Christ. They failed to know who Christ was because they were so focused on making their way to God through their own works that they failed to recognize and come to know Christ for who he is. God's grace was good enough for eternal salvation. His son died on the cross for all sin, for all time, and for everyone, past, present, and future. All we have to do is accept that wonderful gift. Once we accept that wonderful gift, we preach that gospel. We preach that God's grace is enough for all. The more we get to know God and the more we get to know his wonderful gift of grace, the more we begin to act like him and take on his attributes. These are not requirements but for eternal salvation. But as we take on his attributes, the more we become one of his followers and the more we become to know him. We set ourselves apart from this world. We even set ourselves apart from other Christians, those who have the lists of do's and don'ts. We don't follow God's word to be saved. If you are doing that, then you are missing the point. We follow God's words of obedience because we want to be like him and we want to bring glory to him because our and build our relationship with him. And though it's and it's through obedience and that relationship that we know God, that we may become worthy of becoming an overcomer and gaining access to this wonderful kingdom that resides within heaven. Does that make a little bit of sense? Maybe, maybe not. I know some of you don't want it to make sense and you'll berate me later. It'll be awesome and fun. And I probably won't change my mind because I haven't this far. But you can try. Good job. Now, what do you think? These works that we, after, like, these works that we do, now that we are no longer focused on ourselves and we're focused on God, we focus on them bringing glory to God. We live our lives to be like, I am a Christian. This is the way I act now. And people will see that and bring glory to God. I'm not working on doing these works to further my or to gain eternal salvation or to try to persevere that's all make believe okay i'm performing these works to bring glory to god because that's what we're told to do as christians within this age that we're living in right now pre-tribulation and pre-rapture now in verse 24 through 37 he is giving us advice as to why it is important we follow and obey him if we build our life with christ as the foundation then no matter the storm that may arise or the tribulations that we might face, 
we will be able to stand firm in our faith and trust that God is in control. These Christians who built their houses on sands or upon their works for themselves, whenever they come upon hard times, they fail to realize that Christ was the foundation for their life and that they will try to re replace what God did with good works and they will fall over and over and over again. Because no matter the amount of works that you do, it will never be enough to make it into, uh, into heaven. Now, verse 28 and 29 are my absolute favorite um, verses of the chapter because the people were astonished. It says, For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. In verse 28, it says that the people were astonished because this is something that's completely different than what they've been taught. And for some reason, people in today's churches decide that they need to teach exactly what the scribes were teaching. That there's a law and you need to follow the law. And if you don't follow the law, you're going to go to hell. So this is why I find this so foundational. Um, this is why people were shocked. They were shocked because they grew up in a society of scribes that acted better than them and told them what you must that you must do this or you must do that to be saved. But Jesus, not him. Jesus taught it a different way. Jesus told them that the authority was in Christ and that he alone could save them for eternal salvation. The, the scribes, they taught authority from the law itself. But Jesus told them that the authority came from him himself and that you must put your faith in him. Not the law, not these good works or anything like that, but put faith in him and you will be eternally saved. Imagine the relief that these people felt when they realized that Christ himself was the authority and though that they may mess up as we often do as human beings over and over and over again that we're not, not going to have to fulfill the law rather christ has paid that price anyhow that is my take on matthew 7 and why it supports the free grace message and if you have any questions feel free to write me i know some of you will well that's all i have for you today i hope you have an incredible week if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email me at straightwhiteshoe at outlook.com or hit me up on the Twitter at straightwhiteshoe. Keep in mind, me showing you Frosty the Snowman, I was not endorsing drugs. Don't do it. Unless you need a little pick-me-up, I guess. Be sure to check out Jeff Dornick's podcast as well as Battlefront, the Shining Light podcast as well. Visit all of us at thegatekeepersonline.com. This has been The Shoeman Show. <laughs>